So Michael Ramsden, I'm, I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself to you so that you can get to know who he is. I think you will enjoy his uh, demeanor and his way of presenting things, but don't miss the good material. There's lots and lots of good material in this. So this will be on the computer and the volume there, Farron, so you can pick up on that. Okay. Well, it's a delight for me to be here with you this morning, and um, in this uh, first opening session, um, I'm going to be uh, sharing something with you that um, I've been using uh, for, for many years now, actually closing in on a couple of decades, to try to introduce a biblical um, understanding to what um, I've termed conversational apologetics. Um, it's quite interesting to me that um, I first began to formulate it this way one day well over 20 years ago on having a haircut. And I'm going to share that story with you now. Of course, the way of the internet means that a couple of weeks ago, my daughter came to me and she said, Dad, you know what happened to you 20 years ago? You've been telling that story. I said, yeah. She said, well, I've just been sent this email. And there in this email was this story retold uh, by someone else um, with, at the bottom, a promise of thousands of blessings if you pass it on to someone else and the threat of punishment uh, for failure to do so. Um, so I'd like to say that although I am the person behind the story, I have not the person behind the circular email. Um, but let me try to introduce what I want to say to you this way. After my conversion, having lived most of my life in the Middle East and coming to Christ, I can remember within a couple of days very quickly deciding that if, God, if I could ask God for one gift, it would be that he would make me an evangelist. And that's what I prayed for, and that's what I asked he would do. And ever since that time, I was involved in... Um, speaking in whatever context I possibly could, trying to share the gospel with other people. And it's something that I still believe in today, and it's something that I still do, and indeed takes me to um, various parts of the world every year. But there was this instance that happened for me when I was living up in Sheffield that did introduce a radical new idea to me, and it did happen, indeed, while I was having a haircut. Uh, I, at this point, was traveling mainly throughout Europe, a few parts of the Middle East speaking, and I'd been invited to North America, and I didn't know much about the North American church, but I did understand that if I wanted to be accepted there, I'd have to have um, neat hair. And um, so I uh, went off to go and have my hair cut in preparation for this great odyssey. Um, we lived in a small town at that point, my wife and I, called Worksop. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's really the cultural epicenter of Great Britain. And um, I simply walked down about 100 yards to the corner of my road, and there was a small hairdressing uh, salon there that I hadn't been in before. And I walked in, and behind the welcome desk was a very tall and very pregnant-looking um, lady. Um, and she greeted me, and I simply looked at her, and I said, well, and she said, how can I help you? And I said, well, I need a haircut. And she produced an appointment book. And she said, well, when were you thinking of coming? And so I looked at my watch, and I said, now. She looked at her book, and she looked at me, and she said, okay, if we're quick, I can fit you in. I said, that's no problem. I don't have hairstyle. I just have hair, and it needs to be shorter. So she walked me across, and she sat me in a chair. She put an apron around me. She walked off. She picked up her comb and scissors, and she walked back. And as she stood behind me, she turned to the lady who was cutting hair, hair next to me and said, my business is doing so well, but there must be more to life than this. And so I realized at this point this was obviously her shop. So as she turned around to cut my hair, I could now see her eyes in the mirror. So I caught her eye in the reflection, and I looked at her, and I said, you know, what you say is very true. In life, we're not made happy by what we acquire, but by, but by what we appreciate. It's something I'd read in my devotion that morning, and she stared at me, and she said, what did you just say? I said, in life, we're not made happy by what we acquire, but by what we appreciate, and she walked off. And she came back with a pad of paper and a pen, and she said, could you say that one more time? And she wrote it down. Now, at this point, she seemed to be interested, so I thought I would follow through, um, and I'd been preparing a sermon on worship that I preached the Sunday before. So I took one line from that, and I simply said to her, but if you ask me, the trouble we have today, it's not that we feel we have nothing to be grateful for, rather we feel there is no one to be grateful to. And she put down the comb and scissors, and she picked up her notebook and pen, and said, could you say that one more time? <laughs> and then she wrote it down. Um, now, it took her an hour and 15 minutes to cut my hair that day. She wrote everything down. We then, then began talking, and I said to her, have you ever been in love with someone and unable to tell them? I'd just been reading some C.S. Lewis. And she said, I have. I said, it's a terrible feeling, isn't it? She said, yes. I said, but if you're in love with someone and you're able to express that love and it's reciprocated to you, it brings a completeness that wasn't there before. 
And she said, I know exactly what you're talking about. I said, well, that's why to me, worship is so important. I'm a Christian. I go to a local church just around the corner from here. I said, I find that worship brings a completeness to my life that otherwise would be missing. And at this point, she looked very solemn. And I say she was obviously pregnant, must have been at least seven and a half months pregnant. She then looked at me and she said, Michael, I'm so worried about bringing a baby into a world that is filled with so much evil. And so again, borrowing a line I'd heard from Ravi Zacharias, who'd actually borrowed it from someone else, I said, I know there's a lot of evil out there, but what about the evil in here? And then she simply stopped and she said, if there was a way to overcome evil in the human heart, that would be amazing. I said, it's interesting you say that. <laughs> I said, we all feel that we want to change, but it feels like there's a power in our lives that controls us. She said, I know exactly what you mean. She said, I want to be a better person than who I am, but I can't. And so I looked at her and I said, well, the Bible calls that sin, you know. Have you ever heard that word? She said, yes. I said, well, sin isn't just something that describes what we do wrong. It also describes a power over our life. And she said, she said, oh, you know what? I feel like I need someone to rescue me. And so I smiled and looked at her and I said, what you're telling me is you need a savior. And I'm not joking. She went, ooh, that's a good word. Because we don't use that word very often outside of the context of the church. She said, that's a good one. I said, let me explain to you who I think this Savior is. And so that then began this long conversation about, the, about who Jesus Christ was. He comes into this world free of sin and death. And then on the cross, he takes on the forces of sin and death. He dies for us. He becomes a curse for us. He becomes sin for us. He's raised a new life. He conquers over this. He offers this new life. She takes note on the whole thing. And at the end, she says, what should I do about this? And I said, well, you can't sit on the fence forever. You must make a decision. So I went home and I told my wife what had happened that day. We got down on our knees in our front room and we prayed for this lady. Now, I was then thinking, how do I follow her up? So two weeks later, I went back for a second haircut. I've never had such short hair in my whole life. As a matter of fact, when I walked in, she didn't even ask if I wanted a haircut. I walked into the shop. She said, Michael, I will cut your hair. She sat me in the chair, put the thing around me, picked up her comb and scissors, looked at me and said, do you remember the conversation we had two weeks ago? And I said, I can sort of remember what you said. <laughs> She said, well, I went home and I told my husband everything you told me. And I thought this will be interesting. Because as I understand it, I would shared the whole gospel with her as best as I could in an hour and 15 minutes. And so I looked at her and I said, well, what did your husband say? And this funny expression came over her face. Her mouth dropped open. And she said, he told me I was preaching at him. Well, of course she was preaching at him. They both get home from work. They sit down for dinner. Out comes the notebook. Do you know in life you're not made happy by what you acquire, <laughs> but by what you appreciate? It's not that you have nothing to be grateful for. You have no one to be grateful to. That's why worship is so important. There's a lot of evil out there, but what about the evil in here? There's nothing you can do about it, and the Bible calls it sin. That's why you need a savior. I mean, now, <laughs> she appears to be so open to the gospel, and he appears to be so closed. Why? And the answer is she was asking a question. That statement, there must be more to life than this. It's not a statement. It's a question. It's a cry of the heart. Is there anything else out there? And that day, I learned a radical new way of sharing the gospel called talking to other people. And it's this that I really want to commend to you this morning. Now, the, those of us who are interested in apologetics, there's one verse in the Bible in particular that often jumps out. Actually, the word, Greek word for apologetics, apologia, occurs 26 times in the New Testament in a variety of different forms. So it's quite commonly used. Paul uses it to sum up his entire apostolic calling at one point, where he says, I am set for the defense and confirmation of the gospel. That word often translated defense in English translations, the same word, apologetic. We... The, the verse there that I say that we often quote from 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 goes something like this. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, this word in our understanding of apologetics has had a very rich, long theological development and also philosophical development. I'm not particularly interested in the historical development of this word. What I am interested in is in its biblical usage. What does this mean to give an answer, to give an apologetic, something that we're all commanded to do? What does that actually mean, biblically, without all of the later historical development? And why are we all commanded to do it? Now, let me just say a couple of other things about this word, because it's very confusing, because it's never been translated into the English language. It was only transliterated, and we made a new English word, apologetic, which is why most people don't understand it today. We still don't know what it is. 
Now, this word is what a defense lawyer gave on behalf of his client, uh, but it is more than about giving answers or giving a defense. If, if I were to say to you, look, you have to give a defense for your faith, okay? You have to give an answer for your faith. The mental picture that normally comes to mind if you like cricket is someone in front of a very skilled bowler, okay, with an inexperienced batsman somehow trying to deflect away these very difficult things being thrown to them. Now, that isn't a good mental picture. When Paul stands before King Agrippa, he says to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, hear now my defense. Same word. Hear now my apologetic. It's the same word. Now, I, can't, I don't know if you can remember in Acts 26 what King Agrippa's response is to Paul's apologetic. Do you remember? Now, it could go one of two different ways. So you'll see, if you, especially if you pick up something like Metzger on Acts 26, you'll see one of the largest entries on the text at this point because it is possible to translate Agrippa's response as, wow, Paul, you almost convert me really quickly. He's like amazed. Does that make sense? He's expressing amazement at the fact that he's almost converted like that. Or he could be saying, wow, Paul, you think so quickly you can convert me. In other words, his amazement's at Paul. Paul, do you really think in two minutes you're going to convert me? Now, it doesn't matter how you put the emphasis for the sake of translation for what I want to say to you right now. It doesn't matter whether King Agrippa is amazed that he's almost converted, so he's amazed at himself, or whether he's amazed at Paul for thinking he can convert him. But what is the goal, either way you translate it, what is the goal of Paul's apologetic? And the answer is, well, conversion. Agrippa understands one thing after he's heard Paul's apologetic. You want me to become a Christian. So the divorce that has subsequently been made between the idea of giving an answer, an apologetic, and the processes and goals of evangelism is exceedingly difficult to sustain from an exegetical point of view if all you're doing is using the scripture. It'd be very, very difficult, and it's not one that I'm convinced of. The um, uh, late uh, Dr. John Stott, um, our evangelical pope, very famously used the phrase, apologetics and evangelism are the two faces of the same coin. You cannot possibly separate them. Now, this book of 1 Peter, as you all are aware, of course, is one of the general epistles. It's addressed to a general geographical area. It's not addressed to one particular country or city or individual. It's addressed to everyone, which we see in 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. We also see that it's addressed to a group of people who've been dispersed. So they were all in Jerusalem. Persecution came. That drove them out everywhere. And as they went, they took the gospel with them. So it's addressed to the diaspora, to those who've been dispersed because of what has happened in Jerusalem. And we're also told that this is, if you like, therefore, just a very general letter to the church. And in this very general letter to the church, Peter is now writing, inspired by the Spirit, and he says to them, but you, all of you, everyone who calls themselves a Christian, make sure that, number one, Jesus Christ is Lord over your life, over your heart, that means over everything that you are, and number two, that you are ready to give an answer, an apologetic, to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, Peter imagines every single Christian being able to answer the question, why? Why are you a Christian? Have you noticed how in our modern church, when most people are asked, why are you a Christian, we respond by saying, how we became a Christian? Have you noticed that? It's very interesting. But those are two different questions. Why you are a Christian and how you became a Christian are not the same. So we say, why are you a Christian? Well, I met these nice people and they were very kind to me and they invited me to their church and then I did this thing called the Alpha Course and then I went away for a weekend and at the weekend away something strange happened and I became a Christian. Now that's how. But put yourself in a non-Christian shoes for a moment. If a non-Christian is asking why, and they respond by how, and you describe a process, therefore, what does that sound like to the person asking the question? Well, doesn't it sound very random? If you met a Buddhist that day, and you went to the temple, you'd have done the Just Zen course, right? And you'd be a Buddhist. And maybe even more negatively, doesn't it sound a bit like brainwashing? A very good friend of mine, um, who's also, because we have Greek Cypriot mothers, a guy called J. John, when he was converted, his mother looked at him and said, John, you have been brainwashed. He looked at his mother and said, Mother, if you knew it was in my brain, you'd be glad it's been washed. <laughs> but does this, does this sum up the process of conversion? Chance, 
and brainwashing. You mix them together in the right thing and out pop Christians. Well, actually, there are certainly a large number of people today who have that impression. Why we are Christians is not the same as how we became one. Peter envisions every Christian being able to answer the question, why can we? Apologetics isn't about introducing a dose of confusion into the gospel in order to make it sound more profound. But it is about communicating the profundity of the gospel so as to remove the confusion surrounding it. And it's something that we're all envisioned to do. What holds most of us back from doing it is a combination of cynicism and fear. Cynicism, this simply doesn't work anymore. People don't get converted like this anymore. And fear, I'm going to be rejected. But we have to remember that the people to whom this letter addressed could lose their life for doing this. So the fears that we harbor in the Western world, where we've developed a model of discipleship that doesn't demand everything from us and therefore seems to produce very little in fruit, isn't going to stand up when we find ourselves in heaven with a group of people who lost their lives for doing precisely this. And that's true for, the, for large parts of the Christian world today, where people are laying down their lives as they seek to explain why. Are we in that position? So let me just look very briefly at this model that's given to us here and try to explain at least what I see in it. First of all, and I've got sort of seven main points to make here, and point three is subdivided into seven subpoints. Um, <laughs> this is because my, my first degree was in law, and therefore I wasn't educated into the whole three-point uh, thing very well. <laughs> main point number one, then. In your hearts, the Greek word cardia, as I'm sure you're all aware, refers to the seat of your emotional and intellectual life. In your hearts, revere Christ as holy. Make him Lord. Whatever, however, whatever translation you have, it basically is saying Jesus Christ is Lord over everything you are. You make sure that is the case over your intellectual and your emotional life. All of it. The book of James talks about the double-minded man. Now, sometimes people get taught Greek out of the book of James because you can actually teach most New Testament Greek out of the book of James. The slightly strange thing about the book of James is he loves inventing his own words. He actually treats Greek like German. So you know in German you can just stick words together and make bigger and bigger and longer words. Well, that's what, Paul, that's what Peter does with, with uh, sorry, that's what James does with some of his Greek. The word double-minded is a word particular to him. He invents it. He sticks two words together. Now, it doesn't mean to be two-faced, as he uses it. To be two-faced means you pretend to be one thing to one person and something different to someone else. To be double-minded means that you're caught in two opinions and you don't know what to think and you don't know what to believe. Such a person, James says, is spiritually unstable in all they do. Their prayer life is ineffective, not because they're not living correctly, but because they don't know how to think properly. They are caught in two opinions. They still haven't decided in their own mind exactly where they are. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. The spiritual discipline of apologetics died in the Western church when it became a rational, intellectual, abstracted exercise as opposed to understanding to be part of a spiritual battle. Whenever you seek to give the reason, whenever you seek to give an answer as to why you are a Christian, we are engaging in a spiritual battle. We cannot be fruitful in that spiritual battle unless we are right at the center of Christ wants us to be. This is a radical call to follow him, to have him as Lord over every single aspect of our life to be ready to do what comes next. So when your heart set apart Christ as Lord, number one, the Lordship of Christ is something that we, we all find difficult, I know, challenging to preach on, but it's so necessary if we're going to be fruitful in spiritual struggle. Two, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared. Now, this Greek word prepared here carries the idea of it being of getting fit. Now, I've always dreamed of being physically fit. Um, when, when I was growing up as a young, young boy in the Middle East, there was very lax interpretation of the copyright laws which meant that I could get to watch films on VHS cassette, as it was then, before they'd had their world premieres over here. <laughs> and so I watched a huge number of films. Now, there was one actor in particular who made a huge impression on me. Uh, remarkably, has never won an Oscar, um, despite his very impressive body of work, a man by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you may be familiar with his large body of work or just simply his very large body. But either way, um, I can remember thinking, I want to look like him, and I exercised for one week in order to get fit. <laughs> Stood in front of the mirror, and there was no discernible difference. Zero. 
The command to get prepared here anticipates something that takes continual hard work. There's a difference between getting a degree and getting fit. I, I mean, how many of you here have a degree? Just put up your hand if you have one. Okay, that's most of you. Keep your hand in the air if today you could sit the finals for your exams and still pass. Okay, now most hands have gone down. Now, hopefully there are no doctors in the room because if you would fail your exams, then we're more trouble than we think we are. But this is the amazing thing, isn't it? Once you have forgotten the content of your degree, you still keep it. But getting fit isn't like that, is it? You can spend years in physical training, reach the peak of physical fitness, and once you've attained it, you can't then kick back, order in the pizza and the beer, and just watch lots of films. That's not how it works. It isn't a one-off. It's a continual process of application. That's what's anticipated now in this coming command, that we have to get prepared. It's going to be hard, and it takes continual hard work. Number three. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer. Now, that's that Greek word apologetic, apologia. Now, this word doesn't just simply mean giving answers to other people's questions. It also entails the idea of questioning people's answers or even questioning the question itself. Do you want me to say that again? It's not just about learning to give answers to other people's questions. It's also about learning to question, people's question, uh, question other people's answers or question the question itself. Now, you see this supremely illustrated in the life of Christ. And there are seven things that doing, asking questions does. And I'm going to rattle through them very, very quickly because of the time. Number one, asking questions forces people to open up within their general assumptions. There are some assumptions that seem to be true in almost every culture, in every place, in every part of the world, all the time. So let's take... Let's take this city, for example. Imagine at the break time, you were given an exercise. You have a clipboard, you go out onto the streets, and you stop people at random, and you ask them just one question survey. And the question is this. If there is a heaven, so it's a hypothetical, so even an, even an atheist could answer, if there were such a place, how would you get in? What will most people say? Be good. How many of you have been asked, are you telling me that my lovely granny is going to hell, who was such a good person? Anyone been asked that question? This is true in almost all cultures, in all times, in all places. Surely, goodness is the measure, and if there's enough of it, you get in. Now, Jesus Christ was asked that question in Luke 18, 18. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The guy comes up to Jesus, you are good, you have eternal life, I want to be good, I, uh, so I can have eternal life, what must I do? We all know the question very well. Jesus responds with a question of his own. Now, if I were to ask you what must you do to inherit eternal life as Christians, we're all going to say something along the lines of, well, you need to have faith in the person of Jesus Christ, and you need to repent, and, or maybe you like Spurgeon's classical formulation of you need to turn or burn, or whatever it may be. But there is this sense of we turn away from sin and we turn to Christ. We know what the answer is. Someone comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why doesn't Jesus at that point simply say, well, believe in me? That's interesting, isn't it? Is it that Jesus didn't understand the gospel? He was a nice boy, did what he was told, but he only told simple stories and parables. I mean, thank goodness for the Apostle Paul to give us some really heavy theology. I mean, otherwise, you know, we'll be intellectually bankrupt. Well, you can believe that if you want to. I think it would be wrong and probably blasphemous, but... Jesus looks at the guy and says, why do you call me good? Now, there's a good question. What makes somebody good? Hmm. Then he answers his own question, because Jesus wants to be clear to his audience, without any equivocation, if you're good, you're going to heaven. That's basic Christian theology. So there's no doubt about that. The problem is to do with goodness. Why do you call me good, Jesus says? Then he answers his own question. Only God is good. Great. So if you have to be good to go to heaven, which Jesus is affirming here, but only God is good, who is going to heaven? God and no one else. Your application to join the Trinity has just been refused. Okay, minimum entry requirements were not met. Now, do you see what Jesus has done with two very, a very simple question and a very simple answer? He's just turned this whole guy's world upside down. The trouble we often have as Christians is we're so desperate to give answers, we haven't given time enough to think what the question is. This is Francis Schaeffer's complaint about seminaries when he was writing in the 1980s. He said, the problem with graduates from seminary these days is not that they don't know what the answers are, they haven't got a clue what the question is. What is the question? 
By asking questions, Jesus takes people back to their most basic general assumptions. Secondly, it forces cultural assumptions to be addressed with. Now, this is more complicated. I'll spend a little bit more time on this one. Every culture has a particular set of assumptions within it that distort the field of communication. They simply do. And they change. So, for example, Jesus was asked the question in Matthew 22, 15, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Remember that question. Now, let me ask you, as Baptists, should you pay your taxes or not? Okay, let the camera show that one person coughed and everybody else remained silent. <laughs> now, German theologians have been interpreting this text, saying obviously the answer to this question is yes, and the Greek theologians have been interpreting this text, saying obviously the answer is no, and that explains the whole European financial crisis <laughs> in one, one simple observation. Now... Now, we know this question is a trap. Why do we know this question is a trap? Well, it says in Matthew 22, 15, and wanting to trap him in his words, and that's a clue, isn't it? It's like a hint in the text. But we've just agreed, I think, that actually the question's not that complicated, right? I mean, surely the answer to the question is yes, so where's the trap? This question is so politically explosive in the time of Christ that the people asking it don't even want to be there when it's asked. If you read the text carefully, the older guys gather the, gather the younger guys to them. They coach them, ask this question. They send them off on their own to ask the question, so they stay behind. So when this bomb goes off, they're not even in the room. And they send the Herodians, the government officials, with the young men to watch the carnage and then take appropriate action. So what's the trap? Well, the people asking the question are the Jews. The Jews are God's chosen people. God's chosen people have been oppressed by a Roman army. The Roman army is financed by the paying of taxes. If you pay your taxes, you're financing the oppression of God's people. But surely that must be morally wrong, is it not? If you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail, or they simply kill you. No taxes, no life. We're slowly rolling out this taxation policy right now as I speak. <laughs> so, you see what happens now. They come to Jesus and they say, teacher, you're a man of integrity. Well, that's nice. You, you teach the way of truth as it really is. Oh, that's nice too. You aren't swayed by other men. You don't give in to peer pressure. Well, that's also complimentary, right? Three compliments in a row. Tell us then, should we pay our taxes? Now, you see the issue. If Jesus says, yes, pay your taxes, they'll go, ha, you too are prepared to morally compromise to save your own skin then. I'll suggest to you that Jesus Christ would have nothing to do with any such gospel or message. Two, don't pay your taxes. Well, the Herodians are there. Jesus will be arrested, tried on charges of tax evasion, and put in prison. Problem gone. You see why this is such a brilliant question? There are cultural assumptions in here. Now, I'm going to roll a couple of things together because this, par this particular instance highlights a whole series of things. But number three, what it does is, apart from dealing with the cultural assumption that we can see, it also exposes faulty logic. Now, I don't have time to do this with you in detail. This will take an hour all by itself. But there are a fixed number of logical fallacies when we teach logic. I used to teach logic at university. Teaching logic is, I've always maintained, the secular equivalent of speaking in tongues. The difference is, is that when you teach logic and philosophy, even angels can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> now, there are a, a certain number of logical fallacies. They are a limited number, and they are fixed. You can categorize all of them in there. Every type of logical fallacy that exists, you can illustrate from the Gospels and the Book of Acts. You can teach all logic from the Gospels and the Book of Acts, and every type of logical error that exists was used against the disciples, against the apostles, and against the person of Jesus Christ. They never used it themselves. It was always used against them. If people employed faulty logic to try to trap Jesus, trap the first apostles, and trap the later disciples, what makes us think that we're any different? Now, there's something going on here in this question. Two separate issues have been joined together. They have to be separated out. When I was seven years old living in the Middle East, uh, this question popped into my mind one day, and I it, it really enjoyed myself for the next few weeks. Um, at break times, I'd go out into the playground. This will tell you what a horrible child I was. I went out into the playground. I'd find two or three other seven-year-olds playing together. I'd pick one, look at them, and say, in front of their friends, can I ask you a yes or no question? Okay. Okay, my question's this. Does your mother know you're stupid? Now, you see the issue. If they say yes, they're stupid, their mother knows. If they say no, they're stupid, but their mother doesn't know. And if they say, I don't know, they're so stupid they don't understand the question. There is just nowhere to go from there. Now, this is 
where, in logic, you take two unrelated issues, what does your mother know, and are you stupid or not, and you force someone to admit one on the basis of another. It's a great debating trick. It's a form of faulty logic. The only way to answer the question is to separate those two issues. A one-word answer will not suffice. You can't say yes or no. You have to say, I'm not stupid, and my mother knows that. You have to separate these two issues. This is exactly what Jesus Christ does with the question about the pain of taxes. He asks for a coin, whose head is this and whose inscription? And they say, Caesar's. Then Jesus says, then render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. Now, do you see how he's answered the question? Yes, pay your taxes. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. This is his. But holiness consists in giving to God that which is rightfully God's. He has to separate out these issues. Yes or no will not suffice. So the third thing that asking questions does is it exposes faulty logic, which is why Jesus raises this question here. But we Christians have made an expert of walking into these kinds of traps. And when we walk into them, we then claim that we're being persecuted. But there's a difference between being persecuted for the gospel and being persecuted for being stupid. They are not the same. They are not the same. So this is now the fourth thing that asking questions does. It helps clarify what the issue is. What is the issue? I don't have to outline to you today the issues that are facing the church today that we're being tackled on. Throughout the last two millennia, every major issue that's been a political time bomb that the, question, that the church has had to answer is always moral in nature, without exception. Walking into these traps and then letting the bombs go off is not the appropriate response. What are the questions that we need to learn to ask to make sure that we're giving the right answer to the wrong question? Because giving the right answer to the wrong question is always wrong. Giving the right answer to the wrong question is always wrong. A little bit, which is my fifth sub-point under this heading. Just after Jesus silences the guys about paying taxes, do you remember? Another group come to him, the Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection. And they say, Jesus, there was this man. He got married. But very quickly, he died. Now, you have to understand the context, the cultural context for this one as well. When I got married, within nine months, the question was, do you have any babies yet? No. Now, that was fine within nine months. A year and nine months later, when I went back to visit my parents in the Middle East, do you have any babies yet? No. Oh. Two years, nine months later, do you have any babies yet? No. Is everything okay, Michael? Do you want to talk to somebody? Just in case you don't understand how this works. The assumption is you get married, nine months later, babies. Now, you don't need to live for nine months to produce babies, okay, once you've got married. Does that make sense? You, you know, the husband can die before the nine-month period, and you can still have a baby nine months after the marriage date. You, look, if you're confused about this, speak to David Coffey. He can draw diagrams and explain it to you <laughs> without any difficulty. So they say, the emphasis is on speed. Does that make sense? They get married, very quickly he's gone. And he leaves a widow with no children and no children in the pipeline. So according to the tradition that Moses gave us, they say, and this came from none other than Moses, the brother marries the woman. But very quickly, before she can fall pregnant, he dies too. Now that's speed. Praise the Lord, they say, for the third brother. He marries the lady, but before she can fall pregnant, he's also dead. So, according to the tradition that Moses gave us, thank the Lord for the fourth brother. He now marries the woman. He too dies. You would think at one point one of these brothers would realize this woman is not a wife. She is a serial poisoner. <laughs> now, this simple logic deduction occurs to nobody. All seven marry her and all seven die. <laughs> On the day of resurrection, who is she married to, they say? And it appears to be a reductio ad absurdum. It seems to make the whole thing look stupid, doesn't it? And now Jesus has to completely redefine the nature of the world to come. You are mistaken, he said. You know neither the power of God nor the scriptures. For in heaven we are neither given nor taken in marriage, but we will be like the angels. What is it that we're talking about? Can we define the issues? Sixthly, asking questions helps expose contradictions. I don't really have time to go into this into huge detail. The classic one um, that I always liked was, which you hear a bit less of now because of Richard Dawkins, but 
the whole thing about there is no such thing as truth. All the time, of course, we know that when someone says that, they're claiming it's true there's no such thing as truth. But if it's true there's no such thing as truth, then the statement that there's no such thing as truth can't be true because they're claiming it is. But if it's not true there's no such thing as truth, then it's not true there's no such thing as truth. They said nothing but in a very complicated way. Which is why a great British philosopher by the name of Roger Scruton said, when someone's telling you there's no such thing as truth, they're asking you not to believe them. So don't. Now... <laughs> You can either take them down on logic or you can simply ask them the question, what do you believe about truth? Is that true? For many, it's an eye-popping question. <laughs> Lastly, <coughs> asking questions exposes motive, and here we need to be exceptionally careful. In Luke chapter 20, <coughs> Jesus is asked the question, by whose authority are you doing these things? Do you remember that question? And he looks back at the disciples and he says, okay, uh, the disciples, sorry, the religious VIPs who asked the question, he looks at them and says, okay, I will answer your question if you will answer mine. John the Baptist, whose authority did he have? So they all go away into a little holy huddle and they go, oh boy. If we say that John the Baptist had authority from earth, everyone will reject us because they believe it came from heaven. If we say John the Baptist's authority came from heaven, the people will say, why don't you believe him? So they come back and they say, we don't know. Now, is it true? Is it true that they think they don't know? I mean, I know they're wrong, but do they think they know? They think they know. They're not being honest. Now, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't go, ha, ha, I don't know either. He looks at them and says, you will not answer me, and I will not answer you. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Asking questions exposes people's motive. Why are they asking? And sometimes people are asking a question to which they really are not interested in the answer. Now that instance is all the more remarkable because then Jesus Christ then goes on to tell a story that does illustrate where his own authority comes from and from that moment on they plan to kill him. So, but asking questions deals with motive. Why is someone asking? If you want some homework from this session, you have to forgive me, I'm used to setting homework. Go away and think of a conversation that went round and round and round in circles. You can't under, couldn't understand why they didn't understand your very simple answers. And they seem to get increasingly frustrated at the fact that you didn't seem to be tracking their question. If you think about their question more carefully, you'll probably find that something was either going wrong with the logic or their motive for asking it was different to what you interpreted it to be. And therefore, your answer was dealing with one question, but they were actually asking another, and the two missed each other. Apologetics is not about making things complex. To be able to give an answer, an apologetic to anybody, we have to understand what the question is. What do you mean by this question? Not do I, what do I want it to mean? What do I think it should mean? What do I even think the question should be? We need to start off with what the question means to you. And if the question is wrong, let me take you through a process of getting to the right question. H have you ever had a problem, something really confusing, maybe a bit like what I'm doing with you now? And you're thinking, I don't, I'm not following any of this. And then you turn to the person next to you and say, what was he talking about? And then they, they summarize it for you. And they say, well, the, what he was basically asking us was this. And you go, wow. Have you ever had that experience? You've had a problem, and someone asks you the question, and the question sums up the whole problem for you, and you almost feel like giving them a hug. Or, well, obviously, I mean, I'm Middle Eastern, I give hugs and kisses to your British, you sort of shake their hand and offer them a cup of tea. I don't know what it is, but you, you are appreciative, not at this point that they've given you the answer, but they were able to describe the problem. Jesus isn't playing games with people by asking them all of these questions. It's not that he doesn't care for them. It's not that he's playing dice with people's eternal life. He wants them to hear. He wants them to understand. Apologetics isn't just about giving answers to other people's questions. It's also about learning to question other people's answers or even question the question itself. Even two-year-olds can do this. Why? 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 We need to learn what are the questions. Now, very quickly, we can do the next four points fast. In your heart set apart Christ the Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason. That comes from the Greek word logion, logos, where we get the English word word, logic from. The trouble is most of the words we want to use have changed their meaning. I can remember many, many years ago in Worksop, um, my wife and I, we inherited a youth group of 13 girls. Uh, I have to say, I don't think teenagers are my natural um, habitat. Um, uh, and when I'm going to speak at Soul Survivor, I think it's just for novelty effect because they just think, what on earth is he saying? But we should be able to understand. So 
I had these 13 girls, and um, I can honestly say without, and this is not hyperbole, I was more terrified of this audience than any audience I have subsequently spoken to. And I have traveled to remote parts of the Middle East and met with the Taliban, and I've spoken to political leaders, but I spent more time praying and fasting for this particular group than any other group I've ever had. On the first day, I gave all of them a blank sheet of paper and a pencil, asked them to find a quiet space and write, make a list of all the questions they would most like to address in the group. I gathered them all in together and I said, what I'll do next week is I'll see what was the most common and I'll address that issue and we'll go through. So you tell me what you want to talk about when we get together. There was only one question that appeared on every single sheet and it was this, what is love and why get married? You fall in love, you get married. You fall out of love, you get divorced. Better not to get married in the first place. Define love for us. Five days of praying and fasting later, I came up with one illustration. That's how long it took. We get back a week later, we sit in a circle. I say, I want all of you to close your eyes. Everyone closes their eyes. And I said, I want you to imagine you go to school tomorrow and the boy you like most comes up to you and says, I love you, how do you feel? And every face was smiles, ear to ear. I said, now I want you to imagine the following day you go back to school, you hear the same boy telling a different girl, I love you. Now how do you feel? Every smile disappeared. So I simply got them to open their eyes. I said, you see, the words I love you are meaningful because they are given exclusively and committedly to you. Outside of that moral framework of exclusivity and commitment, those words mean nothing. <laughs> Many of the words that you and I want to use to give our reasons, their meaning has changed in this culture. What are the words that you're going to have to rescue to be able to give a logion, to give the word that you want to. What do these words mean? Love, forgiveness, hope. We think we know what people mean by these things. The way the world defines all of these issues, these words today, is radically different from what you and I intend. What do the words mean? Fifthly, always prepare to give a reason for the hope. Now, let me ask you, what is the reason as to why we have hope? Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. His, his name begins with J. <laughs> this is a Christian conference, right? Remember, Jesus is always a safe answer. Right. The reason as to why we have hope is Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his coming again. This is why we have hope. We do not have hope because we have better philosophy, better theology, better morality, or better anything else. The reason why you and how I have hope is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is why we have hope. Therefore, anyone who seeks to give the answer for the reason, for the hope that they have, must do so in such a way that that answer flows to and from the cross of Christ. All apologetics flows to and from the cross of Jesus Christ. You cannot separate it from there, which is why it cannot be separated from the process of evangelism biblically. This is the reason why we have hope. Now, sometimes we need Christian philosophers to teach us about truth, and we need Christian sociologists to teach us about how to interpret culture, and we need Christian historians to help us with our facts, and we need Christian whatever it may be. All of these academic disciplines I have no problem with, and they are all very important, but let's not confuse that with what apologetics is. The apologists may well draw on all of these things to help themselves, to think, actually, this person helps me think clearly about this. But if that's all you've done, if all you've done is philosophy or sociology or anthropology or history or whatever it is, you still haven't given an apologetic. We still haven't given an answer for the reason as to why we have hope. All of this flows to and flows from the cross of Jesus Christ. Lastly, we're told to do this with gentleness, respect, and keeping a, key, keeping a clear conscience. Let me just read a, an email I got from a, a student who studied with us last year uh, and went to Egypt. Um, in July of this year, uh, and I got this a few weeks ago, and let me just share it with him. He says, I was invited to speak yesterday to a group of 60 atheists. They were in a camp discussing atheism and Christianity, and by the way, if you Google Egypt, atheism, agnosticism, you will be surprised at the tens of thousands of blogs you will see. In 2009, Google declared atheist, um, Egypt to be the most religious country in the world, 99.9% of the, of the respondents in their religious attitude survey said they were very, very religious. By the end of 2012, that number had fallen to 74%. 25% saying they were atheist or agnostic. There's been a huge explosion there recently. He says, they were in a camp discussing atheism and Christianity. Most of them are not familiar with Christianity, and on very short notice, I was invited to speak on the topic, are God's laws an obstacle to freedom? I got ready and went. 
Wasim came along, and I took four young guys, another guy who graduated from the center, four young guys I'm discipling, so they could intercede and engage in conversations. Now, in passing, I mention this because we live in a very religious country. Being an atheist is usually by conviction and against a lot of resistance. It is not because of apathy or cultural influence. Imagine 60 intense Middle Eastern angry atheists, some of whom have served time in prison for political activism, sitting in one room with one poor Christian. Mayhem is the right description. Completing a single sentence was a challenge, let alone a coherent thought. As a culture, we lack the courtesy of civil conversation, as you know. We simply overpower. And that's exactly what happened. I got lots of people shouting and throwing curse words at me, lots of fun. For them, the question of God's rules was irrelevant, given they don't believe in God in the first place. The very notion of God is absurd and despicable to them. They kept pushing to more basic questions about the existence of God. I ditched my talk and did an open Q&A discussion. We spent the next three hours going backwards and forth in Middle Eastern-style Q&A, meaning everyone talks at the same time. And although they were very aggressive, they seemed to respect the fact that I took their questions seriously. As time went by, it got better. They listened more. We talked past each other sometimes, but there was something happening there. Finally, someone explicitly asked me to say as a Christian what I believe in. Why did God create this blank world, he said. And for 10 amazingly uninterrupted minutes, I shared the Christian story. Trinity, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. It seemed obvious they'd never heard it before. The session ended at 10 p.m. And until 4 a.m. the next day, Wasim and I talked and talked with tens of them. Some said that they could finally see a step forward, hallelujah. Pray for these people. Most of them hate religion because it has caused so much pain and abuse in their lives. I found myself in deep love and sympathy with them. The organizers just called me an hour ago to come back to the camp again tomorrow to speak about evil and suffering. As the, declined, as the assigned speaker they had just declined to go. I'm currently trying to shuffle my schedule and I hope to go back. We need to do all of this with gentleness, respect, and keeping a clear conscience. There is a hungry world out there they are desperate for the gospel. The last message I preached just 36 hours ago in London, in the final appeal, we saw 30 people come to Christ for the very first time. It doesn't matter if we're here, in the Middle East, in the Far East, in some of the most difficult places. People are open to the gospel as never before. And if we can take their questions, learn what they mean by them, learn to engage with them, we have a bridge which we can cross over to share the gospel with them. And that's what I hope this day will be helpful for you doing. Thank you for listening to me, and I've run out of time. This will be on our website, too. Okay. Um, like Michael Ramsden, he, this is why it's important to come to this kind of thing, uh, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, because this is the kind of stuff that, that you can tap into. Michael is, um, is really an, inc an incredible guy because he... I think primarily because he, he's not just a speaker. He, he gets what he gets because he's on the field and he's on the cutting edge and he's in the trenches with people. Uh, and those are the guys that make the very best apologists because they don't, they're not just doing this out of theory. It's, it's very real to them. Uh, it's the reason Robbie is as good as he is. I mean, what he does because he doesn't restrict himself just to being before audiences of thousands. But, uh, yeah, any thoughts, questions? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll just, okay, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I thought that was a very good video. Very informative, entertaining, edifying. Yeah. Very good. And he, he really is laying the foundation for where we're going to be this morning in Luke 20. This will probably be the only time in my life I'll, I will ever get to follow Michael Ramsden in <laughs> speaking. So that's a pretty hard trail to follow, but we'll, we'll get there. Your brother? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you came in after his explanation of that, but ap apologetics is, is, comes from the word apologia, in the Greek word, which means to give an answer or a defense or a reason for the hope that's within you. It, it appears nearly th about 30 times in the New Testament. Uh, when, when Paul goes before Agrippa, Agrippa says, you, always, you, you almost make me believe. 
and the word he, he uses there is an, is an apologia. It's not, it's not to apologize for the faith, it's to give an answer. And to give an answer, how, ma- how many of you recognize that we're part of, the, uh, part of our training session on uh, doing evangelism, anything from this video? Asking questions. Questions. Making sure what questions. The question was. And, yeah. Um, doing, I, I wanted to say something else too. Going yeah, l- back let, me, let me just make a point of that before you do. Hold on to your question or your thought. Um, this is the, the least thing done by most people trying to do evangelism. Everybody wants to jump in there and, and present the gospel. And as, as Michael Ramsden said, we don't even know what the question is. You've got to get to the bottom of what are people actually asking. I've been having this email conversation with a person back in North Carolina for about two months now. And there's been a huge frustration because they were w- raised in one tradition and I, was, and I was educated in another tradition and we've been doing this thing that Michael described this morning, talking past one another. And it's because, and, and I keep asking the qu- questions that are important but, but they're giving answers to thing I'm, things I'm not asking. And, and I keep trying to get to, okay, what is the answer to this question? Don't, don't answer another question, just answer this question. And that's why asking questions is important. It's the model Jesus gave us. It's the model Paul gives us. So don't be so quick to jump in there. And, I, and it's the thing I've tried to drive home with our, the, the team that's going out doing evangelism. And I feel sometimes I've just failed miserably. Because we want to jump in there and do this without, without getting to the bottom of it. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. And you can get to the bottom of what the real question is. Yeah. Up until recently, John, that's what I also thought too, because that is what it sounds like. And then after I learned that, just kind of because I'm a curious person, um, I have a really nice multiple volume Oxford English Dictionary. And I looked up apologetics once just to see what it said. And that's actually the only definition that it gives is that it's a theological, that it's a theological defense. It didn't, it, what, there wasn't any secular meaning given to it at all. It, that surprised me too. That's, I thought you might find that interesting. But, but in the Greek world, it is a word that is used for somebody that is in, in a court and you've got an attorney representing you. The attorney is giving a defense or giving a reason why his client should be set free or whatever. So we are, it's one of the reasons that well-trained lawyers make great apologists. If they ever get converted and they really understand what, what it is to know Christ, uh, they're, they're used to that, that kind of thought. And you'll notice in a court of law, lawyers always ask questions, 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 because they're trying to get to the bottom of something. Um, as you were talking about apologetics or apolog- the word apology, argument is another one that he addressed yeah. Uh, towards the end is that the meanings have changed in the secular world yeah. and uh, that leads to confusion much like the apo- apology I'm sorry as opposed to a defense yeah. an argument suggests a conflict rather than a position yeah. in our in our culture today yeah okay we're we're running a little over so grab you some coffee and we'll be back in here shortly